Oh, hey, welcome back. Just give me one second. Uh, that one's gonna go there. This one, bit of cloud, bit of land. Oh yes. Voila, the whole picture. And that small piece is connected to all these other different pieces. The whole jigsaw puzzle is a system. And what we get as a sum is greater than all of its parts. That's the way we need to consider Earth's climate, as an integrated system with lots of parts interacting together. But it's even more than this though, it's more like my bike. This has different connected parts. The pedals turn the chain, which turns the gearing, makes the wheel rotate, and of course, the brakes stop it. Each part has a particular function and they all work together. And what's more, these connected systems need my power to make the big system work. A little bit of oomph from me and all these parts work together to form a complex whole, a dynamic, energy-driven, complex system. And that's what Earth's climate is, a dynamic, energy-driven, complex system. The components, the smaller systems, are air, land, water and ice, and life. They're all interconnected, and they're all driven by the energy of the sun. All the components in these spheres are interconnected. What affects one can affect another. Just like if my chain broke, then my pedals would no longer move it, so the gears wouldn't rotate and the wheels wouldn't spin. The interaction of our planet's spheres is key to what is happening to our climate. Let me give you an example of these interactions. Remember, the sun heats the Earth unevenly. Basically, the poles are naturally cooling down and the equator is naturally heating up. One of the ways to distribute that heat is with the water, the hydrosphere. As we just heard, the oceans absorb heat from the sun and transport it around the globe in a giant pattern of currents. The currents are driven by local temperature and the salinity of the water, how salty it is. At its surface, the ocean also interacts with air, with the atmosphere, creating the trade winds and the jet stream that you may have heard of. There's a lot of complexity there in just a few of the interactions with the ocean. So to build a useful model for the global climate, you've got to model not just each of these individual complex systems, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, and the biosphere. You also have to model how they interact with one another. And that takes some very, very complicated maths. And it's a challenge even for our best scientists using the most powerful computers. Doing just that though is Dr. Olivier Boucher and his team at the Pierre Simon Laplace Institute in Paris. In Paris, it's raining cats and dogs as we meet Olivier at the IPSL. You're all familiar with the with weather forecast, the prediction of the weather a few days ahead. Like today, it's raining and there is some strong wind, and that was predicted from last week. Here, we're interested in the modeling of the climate system. Building a climate model means dealing with a whole load of data. We rely on a number of physical laws, such as the conservation of mass, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, and, and we discretize them onto a, a grid, which looks like that, with a number of grid points. And at every grid point, then we can resolve temperature, humidity, and wind. But that's not enough, because with such a grid, we're missing all the processes which occur at a very fine scale, especially all the interactions of the atmosphere with the surface, everything that relates to the water cycle, the exchange of energy through radiation, whether it's solar energy or infrared radiation. So all of that, occur at very small scales, which have to be parametrized. We need to understand the effect of all these processes on these main equations. Each physical feature of each grid cell is turned into a line of computer code. So taking an example here, we have a loop that works on every grid box. Uh, and we have a test here that's an if-then statement that basically says that if there is enough water 
in the in the atmosphere in in a cloud if there is too much water then this water will precipitate so we generate precipitation which is here you see that rain variable so essentially we have so many lines of code to represent all the different processes in the atmosphere Altogether, more than a million lines of code, the equivalent of 18,000 pages of printed text, are needed to solve the climate equations. In Paris, they are processed by Irène Curie and John Zay, two supercomputers. Every climate simulation requires about 1,000 processors as part of this supercomputer, and it requires one day to simulate about 15 years of climate. But we want to simulate many more years of climate, like thousands, tens of thousands of years. So we used up the computer for a full year, 24 seven, to generate uh, thousands of years of statistics of the climate system. Modeling the climate is a complex job. There are just so many interactions going on. These models have been tested on the past climate in order to be sure that they're strong enough to predict the future. And what we see today supports the models. See the curves here. These are three different scenarios built by James Henson in 1988. Three different predictions for how the temperature could change depending on the level of greenhouse gas emissions from human activities looks to me like the actual observed temperatures are run pretty close to scenarios B and C. And as it's continuing to rise rather than fall, it's closest to B. So the model's predictions 30 years ago are holding up. One noticeable difference though is this dip. The observed temperature in 1992, and that's interesting. It was the result of a massive volcanic eruption. In 1991, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted and it caused the Earth's temperature to drop. An event that would have been a little hard to predict even for the best scientists. And what's even more encouraging is that that model from 30 years ago has continued to be improved upon year on year. <laughs>